on today's episode of the Wrestling New Legends podcast, the one and only wrestling legend, Ken Patera. From the AWA to the WWF, Patera did it all. Also before that, it was in the Olympics, the Pan Am Games, a standout in high school. Patera has quite the story to tell, and without any further ado, here he is. What was it like competing in the 1972 Olympics during a time where the tension between America and so many other countries was so high? Well, uh, the tension? Yeah, because this was, a, you know, in, in 1972, we were starting to come into to really, like, the Cold War, and, and about eight years from then, you know, um, it got real intense. But, you know, during that 1972 time, what was it like competing with other countries? Well, you know, that's a tough question because the athletes always got to, uh, got together and uh, had a few uh, uh, beers and a few whiskeys. And, uh, you know, uh, I never did drugs, but some of them would uh, smoke marijuana and pop pills. And uh, so everything uh, was pretty mellow uh, in the Olympic Village. But uh, Yasser Arafat, that camel jockey uh, from, uh, uh, where the hell was he from? Uh, Israel. No, he he wasn't Israeli. He was uh, Palestinian. Okay. He's the one that started the Palestine, or he didn't start it, but. He was the one that was fighting the Jews and uh, fighting, uh, you know, the Egyptians. He was fighting everybody because he was, uh, he's a little, uh, uh, I think he was a homosexual. Uh, Although uh, he was married, I don't believe he had any children. But, yeah, he he was nuts. And so uh, on the 5th, On September 5th, 1972, I remember that date very well because that was the date that I was originally scheduled to compete in the 72 Olympic Games. But but anyway, uh, about 5.30 in the morning, uh, the Palestinian uh, terrorists, they came over the back fence of the Olympic Village and that's exactly where the Jewish delegation uh, were uh, staying in the Olympic Village. And uh, they invaded their compound there and uh, uh, shot them all up. And uh, they all had ski masks on, or those stocking caps that you pull down over your head and cut holes in for the eye sockets. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, about six in the morning, uh, I look out my window from uh, our compound in the Olympic Village, and I see uh, all these terrorists running around the balconies of the Jewish uh, team. I could see him straight across, clear view, no obstruction. I could see them very visibly uh, from my, uh, uh, let's call it a hotel room. And uh, they were all carrying those, uh, what do you call it, AK-47s or whatever they call them, uh, automatic weapons. Mm Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, they, they're, they're just shooting the place up. So a couple of my teammates come barging into my room. I had a private room. And uh, they come barging into my room. Ken, Ken, you got to come over here and watch what's going on on TV. Well, the, uh, the German uh, uh, television had... They were filming the whole thing. I said, well, hell, I, I'm watching it live and in person right from my room here. 
And so they looked out my window. Oh, my God. That's what they're showing on TV. So I walked down the hallway uh, in the TV uh, room area. And uh, there was about 10 or 12 of us uh, watching this thing uh, uh, unfold on TV. And uh, so what the hell's going on here? And then, you know, bits and pieces uh, of the uh, telecast would uh, inform us what happened. You know, the Palestinian terrorists came over the back fence and uh, uh, attacked the Jewish uh, uh, delegation or, the, you know, the Jewish uh, athletes. And uh, I had some friends over there that were Jews. And uh, it kind of pissed me off. And so anyway, uh, uh, now we have to understand that's like, by this time, it's like 7 in the morning. And by noon, uh, the Olympic uh, officials uh, had uh, gotten together and agreed because this is such an awful act that they're going to cancel the remainder of the Olympics. And I said, what? I said, I'm I'm supposed to compete in uh, weightlifting that night. And so anyway, they canceled it. So I'm talking to some of the other weightlifters, and uh, it was just the heavyweight division that was competing that night anyway. All the the lighter weight classes, uh, they had already finished up their competition. But uh, they all liked to come over, you know, be spectators uh, for the big guys. You know, I was one of the big guys. So anyway, uh, that didn't transpire. And so I said, well, what are you guys going to do tonight? Weightlifting is canceled. I'm canceled. Everybody's canceled. Uh, So one of the guys says, well, why don't we go downtown Munich to the Hofbrau house and get drunk? And I said, that sounds like an excellent idea. So on the way down the elevator, down to the lobby, we're on the, like the fifth or seventh floor, something like that. I bumped into a couple of uh, 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 track and field guys, uh, hammer throwers, discus, shot putters. And I said, what are you guys doing? Uh, they, you know, they're just milling around the lobby. I said, well, I want you to go downtown uh, Munich with this. Well, how are you going to get there? I said, well, the subway's right below the Olympic Village here. We're going to jump on the uh, subway and go right downtown Munich. Well, just a minute, we'll grab our stuff. So they, we waited about 15 minutes, and here they come. Now there's about 10 or 12 of us. So we get downtown Munich, get off the subway. Uh, there's a line about, you know, two blocks long at the Opera House. That's where uh, Hitler used to give his uh, big talks uh, to the populace when he was uh, getting ready to uh, become a politician back in the 30s and early 40s. And, Anyway, uh, so we couldn't get in there. It's like a three-hour wait. So I asked this guy, stand in line. I said, hey, is there any other restaurants around here that can accommodate 10 or 12 of us? Oh, yeah. About uh, a block down, there's a beautiful restaurant down there. And they're not busy at all. So... We, we go down there. I went inside, and I t- I'm talking to the, the girl uh, waitress. And I, I asked her, I said, you guys have uh, Wiener Schnitzel and Ham Hocks and all that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 
I said, as good as the hot bra house? He said, better. <laughs> so that's all I needed to hear. So we all pile in. They got a big table for us. And uh, everybody orders uh, beer. They come in those 22 or 24 ounce steins. Mm-hmm. Big, big, you know. Oh, yeah. And so anyway, yeah, we're, at that time, we were only a couple uh, weeks away from, uh, uh, what's that big uh, festival they have every year over there? Uh, God, I can't remember. Oktoberfest? Anyway. Yeah, Oktoberfest. Okay. And so we're, and the, the Munich was just loaded up with uh, tourists, you know, from all different uh, countries and everything. And so it was a real festive uh, type of atmosphere. And because not everybody had heard about the uh, Arafat and the. Palestinians coming over the back fence and started killing Jews. Uh, as a matter of fact, very few people even knew about it. Because it, you know, it only happened a few hours prior to that. So anyway, uh, we're, uh, we sit there and everybody's flopping down the beer. Uh, somebody ordered, uh, Ruffle much. Uh, it's a it's a liqueur. It comes in shot glasses. It's hundred proof or hundred ten proof. It's strong, but it tastes good. It tastes just like licorice. And uh, so we started pounding those. I don't know. We had two or three, and then yeah. By the time we got our food, uh, I I was half. Uh, drunk by then and uh, I'm trying to think uh, oh yeah I know it I ordered a big ham hock two wiener schnitzel uh, mashed potatoes uh, coleslaw yeah I think that's all I ordered but uh, it was fantastic food it really was and the the booze was excellent. The beer was fantastic. The Ruppelmans tasted just like licorice. We were having a good time, getting all fucked up. And uh, we stayed there till about 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, I guess. And then we wandered out, uh, stumbled out, I should say. And we went to a few other uh, bars. But anyway, uh, by the time we uh, we decided to go back to the Olympic Village, well, we had to be back by midnight because they they closed the gates at midnight. So we uh, we left there about ten o'clock, I guess. Got the subway back to the Olympic Village, and uh, man, we were all shit faced. <laughs> oh man. We were blown away. I, I don't know. I, I must have had uh, 20 of those big beers. And I don't know how many uh, schnapps I had. And uh, because, you know, competition's canceled, right? Sure. Yeah. So about 8 in the morning, uh, our team manager, Rudy Sablo, uh, he comes into my room and says, Ken, Ken, you got to get up. You got to get up. We got to go way in. I said, what are you talking about, Rudy? Get out of here. I thought he'd ribbon me. He said, no, I'm serious. They uh, reinstated the, the game. Uh, you're competing tonight. <laughs> wow. I mean, I was fucked up. I said, Rudy, you don't understand how much booze we drank last <laughs> night. Wow. And uh, he said, I've been, in, I've been in the dormitory room with all those other guys. They were all passed out. And uh, I says, wow, I drank more than anybody. But, of course, you know, I weighed 320 pounds in the 
the lighter uh, guides, you know, mm-hmm. and you know the smaller weight classes, you know, they're uh, 132, 148, 165, 181, 198, uh, 242-pound classes. You know, that's a, I was a lot bigger than all those guys. But anyway, uh, uh, I said, Rudy, I said, I don't even know if I want to compete after all this bullshit. Oh, no, 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 don't have that in, dude. I said, I'm just kidding. So we get on a bus the way in. The way in place is, you know, normally it'd be like a 10, 15 minute drive. That bus took three hours to get from the Olympic Village over to the training hall. Three fucking hours on that bus because of the traffic. You know, it, everybody was in town. You know, for the Olympics, you know, all the fans and stuff, spectators. And we finally get over there. I just, I'm feeling rough. I'm, I'm green uh, around the gills. And uh, I tell you, so we get weighed in. And uh, I said, we drove or uh, rode on a bus for three hours for this bullshit. I said, what the hell? We're... We're all super heavyweights. We all weigh over 300 pounds. You know, it's not like we have to cut weight to make a weight uh, class, you know. And he said, yeah, but in case there's a tie, then the light, lighter guy will win. I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. So anyway, uh, uh, and now it's like, one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. We don't compete till eight o'clock at night. So we're three hours away from the Olympic Village. You know, I, I want to take a nap. Where the hell can I take a nap at? And uh, so we went into the training hall, and uh, they had a stack of mat, mats there. I laid down, took about a two-hour nap, and. Uh, so then it's time to compete. Well, I had a bad knee. My knee, I hurt my knee two, two years before the Olympics. And periodically it would swell up and just give me a hell of a time. And uh, as a matter of fact, in that two year period, I had to drop out of a couple uh, meets because my knee was so bad. And, uh, so anyway, uh, about 10 months before the Olympics, I was living in, in Minneapolis at the time. I flew down to Oklahoma City and had Dr. O'Donohue operate on my knee because I, I, I couldn't even walk anymore, let alone train. Uh, it turns out he was the guy that... Uh, uh, operated on the knees of all the football players, you know, the big ones, uh, like Joe Namath. Uh, he did uh, Joe Namath's uh, knees like three or four times. Uh, uh, Joe had bad knees. <laughs> but anyway, he operated on my knee. He said it's going to take six to eight months to heal. Six to eight months? I said, holy shit, the Olympics are 10 months away. He said, no, I know. I I told you that's going to be a long healing uh, process. You know, nowadays, you'd you'd be up competing in a month and a half, two months. But back then, they didn't have orthoscopic uh, surgery or anything like that. So anyway, uh, I was able to come back pretty quick. I came back after about five months. And uh, I was competing in a a regional meet in San Francisco. And I set uh, four American records. And I had the highest total in the world that year. And that's the total of the military press, snatch, and clean and jerk. 
you know, your best list in each one of those categories, you'd add them up and you get a total. And that's how they uh, 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 determined who the winner was going to be. And I had the high, I set the highest total in the world that year. So it was uh, the powers to be said, well, the favorites are Ken Patera from the United States and Vasily Alexia from Russia. There are two favorites to win the gold medal in the super heavyweight class. Well, come meet time, my knee was all swollen up. I couldn't uh, do a full squat, uh, which is required when when you're lifting heavy weights. And so I, I opened up in the military press. I won a bronze medal in that. Then the next lift, the snatch, the two-hand snatch, uh, my knee had gotten even worse. And I wasn't able to hit a full squat position, so I bombed out. Alexia went on to win the gold medal. I was so pissed off. I said, you know, I trained four years for this goddamn competition, and this is what it comes down to, a, a, a fucking injury. So uh, that was my last amateur competition. And uh, as I was leaving the uh, stadium, I took I, I had all my weightlifting gear, my weightlifting belt, everything in, in the duffel bag. I just dropped in the first gar- garbage can I came into. And that was it. I walked out. And uh, uh, there was another competitor, Russell Nip. He was our 148-pound uh, weightlifting champion. And he says, Ken, what are you doing? I says, Mom, I'm, I'm going to become a professional wrestler now. I'm not going to lift weights anymore. Uh, he says, oh, come on. You know, four years is, is nothing. You know, you can, uh, you can come back. I said, Russ. I'm an amateur athlete in the United States of America. I'm broke. I need some money. So uh, he says, well, I understand. Uh, so anyway, I wound up uh, flying back to Minneapolis. Uh, prior to that, uh, Greg Gagne, uh, he's the son of Vern Gagne, the the world champion in the AWA and uh, people that uh, followed the AWA, they they know who Vern Gagne was. I have a lot of questions about the AWA, and I really think it was a unique. I, th- I think it was a unique time with the AWA because it was more so a wrestling based um, company, and he really liked bringing in amateur wrestlers like yourself. Yeah, you know, we talked about Brad Renegans in a previous podcast, things of that nature. He loved guys exactly like you with that athletic background. What was it like working for Vern? Well, Vern, Vern was an uh, egomaniac. Uh, he wanted everything uh, his, his way, his way or the highway. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was good. He trained uh, me. Uh, Rick Flair, Greg Gagne, his son, his son's uh, tag team partner, Jimmy Brunzel, jumping Jimmy Brunzel, mm-hmm. uh, Osro Viseri, Iron who Sheik. was, uh, yeah, the Iron Sheik, and another kid by the name of Bob Bruggers uh, from Minnesota. Uh, Bob Bruggers played football with uh, Wahoo McDaniel. For uh, when they were both out the Miami Dolphins, but anyway, uh, so it was a hell of a training camp. You know, six of us, uh, all uh, all great athletes, uh, amateur athletes, and that's exactly what Byrne wanted. Uh, Rick Flair won the state high school wrestling uh, championship in Wisconsin a few years before that. Jimmy Brunzel played. 
football for the University of Minnesota. Uh, Cosmo Missouri, of course, was in the 68 Olympic Games as a Greco-Roman wrestler for uh, Iran. Uh, Bob Bruggers was an all-pro football player. Uh, Greg Gagne, Vern's son. Sure. He wound up playing quarterback at Wyoming, at the University of Wyoming. So everybody had legitimate credentials, and that's what Vern loved. He loved to have uh, guys that had gone through the amateur wars and uh, had proven themselves, and uh, and of course I was, you know, a, Olympian, uh, four-time national weightlifting champion, uh, four gold medals in the '71 Pan American Games. I'd been to four World Weightlifting Championships. Um, so yeah, we, we're all legitimate guys. And uh, Burns beat the shit out of all of us. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Yeah, I heard the stories yeah. of uh, how intense those camps were. You know, after you were there for a little bit, they eventually put you against a guy named Paul Hogan, who at the time was still kind of finding his way. In the early days before uh, Hulk Hogan went to the WWF, you know, and he got to start there in AWA, when you were wrestling with him, did you sense anything like he had the potential to become the next big thing, or was he just another guy? Well, let me straighten you out in the time frame. Sure. 1980, 1980 uh, I was starting back for the second time in the WWF, and Hulk Hogan was a rookie. And that he started in the WWF. Well, I should say that he started down in Florida, then he went over to uh, Tennessee and uh, I think Rocky Mountain. Mm-hmm. Or no. Uh, uh, no, you're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. I, that's my mistake. I forgot about that because he did. And then he went and filmed Rocky Three. <laughs> which caused him to leave and then go to the AWA. So you, you're correct on that. Right, because I, I was in the WWF. I was the head honcho there. I was uh, beating the shit out of Bruno a few years prior to that, and then I was beating Bobby Backlund up, and then I was uh, uh, pitted against... Uh, uh, Bruno? Uh, the, huh? Bruno San Martino? Yeah, I, I wrestled him about 30 times. And, yeah. uh, sold out the garden. Oh, we sold out the garden three times. That's right. Uh, the, the Spectrum in Philadelphia, Boston Garden. Uh, they glue over there in uh, uh, Pittsburgh. All the major arenas, which there were about seven or eight, we sold them all out three times in a row and uh then uh i was in 77 78 and then i went back to uh mid-atlantic uh championship wrestling down in charlotte north carolina and uh i uh i think it was uh rick flair i, I beat rick flair for the or was it wahoo I can't remember who I beat for the Mid-Atlantic Championship. That was a very prestigious uh, belt uh, at that time. But anyway, uh, uh, in the WWF in 1980, I beat Pat Patterson for the Intercontinental Belt. Now, let, let me set the record straight on that. Pat never won the belt. He was in a supposedly in a fictitious tournament down in Rio de Janeiro. Mm-hmm. But but that tournament never took place. Right. But, but he was awarded the Intercontinental Belt. So when I started having a, a, a feud with Pat Patterson, I beat him. So I actually am the first one that won that belt legitimately so you can call me the first inter, international uh, or intercontinental champion 
of all time. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sir. And the hunky talk, man, always goes on. I've, I've held intercontinental belt longer than anybody, so I'm the greatest of all time. <clears throat> Fuck you, honky talk, man. <laughs> you know, a great thing. Yeah. To- a great thing that you had early, um, well, not really early, but, you know, a couple years in your career for sure, you started working with a guy who I feel is the greatest manager of all time, Bobby the Brain Heenan. What was it like working alongside the Brain? Oh, the Brain was excellent. We were good friends. Uh, he had uh, managed uh, guys like Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens uh, prior to me, and... Uh, we got along uh, super. Uh, he liked the drink, and I liked the drink. <laughs> so we, we knew each other for quite a while. And uh, so Bobby, uh, he was an interesting type of guy. You know, he got kicked out of high school, so he never graduated from high school. And uh, it was, uh, but he was smart. He was a smart kid. He grew up in Indianapolis, uh, went to boarding school over in Chicago. It was a military academy type of school. His mother sent him over there because he was out of control. He needed discipline. So he gets over there, and they even kicked him out of there. So... (laughs) So he wound up back in Indianapolis, and of course that's where uh, uh, Dick the Bruiser and uh, Wilbur Snyder, they were running the wrestling promotion over there, and they would go into Chicago, uh, uh, some other towns. You know, at that time, it might still might be true, I'm not sure, but at that time, Ohio had more cities of 100,000 population uh, than any other state. So it was a great place to have a wrestling promotion. And uh, they did box office business. So when when Bobby was like 15 years old, he used to go down to the arena there in Indianapolis and hang out and uh, he got to know Dick the Bruiser. And uh, so Dick the Bruiser says, uh, and Bobby tells uh, Dick that he wants to be a manager. So Dick says, well, I don't know about being a manager, but you can be a ring boy. And he says, uh, you go out to the ring with all these wrestlers each, you know, during each match, you bring back their, uh, their, uh, 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 ring jacket and uh, what, whatever else they uh, have to have brought back. So Bobby jumped all over that. So he thought he was going to get paid. Well, Dick the Bruiser never paid him anything. <laughs> so finally, after a couple months, Bobby asked Dick, he says, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Athos, uh, uh, or Mr. Bruiser, his real name was Dick Athos. He was a Greek Greek guy. And anyway, uh, so I think Dick used to give him like 2 or $3. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bobby would be down there all day long, all night long, and because he loved it. But that's how Bobby back or Bobby Backlund, Bobby Heenan got his start in professional wrestling was as a, a ring boy. So and he loved. Him. You know, it's really cool too because he and you, you and him, were part of so many great storylines. One of which was something I think truly unique. Um, you and Big John Stud had cut the hair of Andre the Giant, which is really probably one of the craziest stories ever because I would have to believe that Andre the Giant didn't do anything that Andre the Giant didn't want to do. So how were you guys able to convince him to allow you to cut his hair, or did you just go ahead and do it? No, no, no. It's, uh, Andre wanted to be a pretty boy. 
So he had, he had that long, shaggy hair, head of hair. So uh, we set it up where uh, uh, Stud and I uh, was in a TV match, tag team, against him and uh, S.D. Jones. So anyway, we beat the shit out of S.D. Jones, for, throw him out of the ring. And then the uh, three of us attacked Andre. I wound up coming off the top rope with a big knee. Man, I hit him right alongside the head, knocked him cold. And he, he's laying there. And we're trying to set that big bastard up on his butt, you know, <laughs> so we cut his hair. I'm not kidding. I'm, no, I believe you. True. Yeah. True, true story. So he uh he pulls out the scissors, and uh, I'm holding Andre up, and John Stud is cutting his hair off. And, man, we cut off most of it, like 80%, 90% of it. And uh, so uh, that, that, then we put it in a plastic bag, his hair. And then finally Andre wakes up and, realizes what what happened you know it was like samson and delilah type of story you know when delilah cut uh, samson's hair he lost all his strength yep well andre didn't lose any strength <laughs> he got up and started beating the piss out of us so we jumped out of the ring like uh rats off a off a a, a, a ship Yep. And, uh, yeah, oh, God, he went nuts. You know, but anyway, yeah, no, that, that was all set up. He's yeah. so, he was so big. You know what I mean? It, and it was like, there's strength and then there's just size. You know, why do you feel he was able to be yeah. as early in his career? Because we all know the story is late when he hurt his back and everything. But do you think he would have been the kind of guy that if he was in better shape, when he really began that that big WWE or WWF push, that um, you know Vince McMahon might have pushed him instead of Hulk Hogan as the, as the number one guy when the WrestleManias began. No, because Andre was a very unique uh, type of. Uh, uh, he was a celebrity that was literally known all over the world. Uh, you know, he grew up in France little village outside of Paris, France. And so, you know, he spoke like six different languages. And uh, I guess that's typical of Europeans. But, uh, yeah, no, he he was uh, a very unique type of uh, uh, commodity. Uh, let's call him a commodity. Because mm-hmm. everybody knew who he was and his size and Everybody wanted to meet uh, Andre the Giant simply because he was a giant, seven foot four, five hundred pounds, and uh, you know he, the people, the wrestling fans, everybody was in awe of him, especially when he go into a restaurant and everybody wanted to know how much is he going to eat now. Yeah. And how big he, yeah, well, I said, well, don't worry about how much he's going to eat. How much is he going to drink? Yep. <laughs> and, oh, man. Uh, I went, I, well, you didn't go out with Andre unless he invited you. Yeah. And, and so anyway, he would invite me to go everywhere with him when it uh, came to restaurants and uh, bars and whatnot yeah we, we, we got along uh, fantastic and uh, uh, I, I I wound up uh, wrestling him over in Japan a few times I remember uh, one time Ken what are you doing tonight I said what are you doing he said let's go to Rudy's I said what's Rudy's he says a German restaurant uh, here in Tokyo, and he said, "I want you to come along." So great, I said, "I'm there." So uh, it was uh, Dick Murdoch and myself, and God, who was, I think Freddie Blassie, 
guy, I, I maybe Dino Bravo and uh, myself. Uh, there, there's about five or six of us. So we go to Rudy's. And it was owned by Rudy. <laughs> Rudy was from Germany. And he was about 55 years old, big guy, 6'3", well over 300 pounds. And he just loved Andre. Because every time Andre was in Tokyo, he he wind up going to Rudy's. And uh, we're sitting, so he gets us to the table, and uh, right in the middle of the place. And the place is packed. And it wasn't an overly large place, but... It was good size, and it was packed. And so uh, he puts one waitress on our table. That was her job the rest of the night was taking care of us. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure. That's awesome. So, anyway, Rudy sent her over to the table with a, uh, with a tray of uh, uh, Rumpelmann. Jägermeister and Goldschlag. Those were all la- liqueurs, hundred proof and higher. Mm-hmm. So here she comes. There had to be about 20 shots on that platter. And she sets it down the table. Uh, we just helped ourselves. It was a round table so we could all reach. And so we start pounding those down and, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, that Rumpelmann, god damn, I got fucked up on that stuff over in Germany. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 And anyway, Jägermeister, Goldschlump. Yeah, it was fantastic. So now we're, now uh, she brings, I don't know, 12, 15 huge uh, 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 classes of beer. And the, the, I think they were the same as uh, when I was in Germany, about 24, 22, 24 ounce uh, steins. And uh, I mean, he had a, not, being German, he had an authentic German restaurant right in the middle of Tokyo. And uh, he, he uh, uh, served, you know, the big ham hocks, Wiener schnitzel, mashed potatoes, uh, sauerkraut, coleslaw, everything. So we're sitting there pounding those uh, Jägermeisters, and now here comes the beer. And I said, well, let's order some food. Andre said, I can't, I already ordered for you. You're getting big ham ox, Wiener schnitzel, there we go. mashed potatoes. Yeah, he tells me. I said, shit, that's what I... <laughs> um, that's why I had over in Germany. Ready to eat. Yeah, you're making me hungry. Yeah, in 72. And now, I think that was like 1980. You know, like eight, yeah. seven, eight years later. Having the same thing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, yeah I, I, Andre, knew, Andre knew how to eat and drink, I'll guarantee you that. He had such a fascinating life. I wanted to ask you too, and this is a subject that you could, you know, you could talk about if you want. And, and if you just want to tell me to shut the fuck up, I will. It's up to you. Um, you, you were steaming yeah. along pretty good. Everything was going great, and then you had to take a year away from wrestling to serve um, a prison sentence. If you wouldn't mind talking, like what actually happened, and you know, because there's been so many stories about it, but if you don't mind, what actually happened that night? That where you got in trouble, a lot of people say you threw a rock through a window or something crazy like that. Well, the thing is, I was at McDonald's trying to get a couple hamburgers for me and Mr. Saido. And a kid that uh, got fired by McDonald's a couple of days prior to that, he's the one that threw the rock through the window. Oh, boy. Okay. And I, I, yeah, I got accused for it. And uh, the... Uh, I'm down there at McDonald's. I think it was like 12 o'clock at night. And uh, uh, it was down, uh, down a real steep hill. 
from the Holiday Inn that we were staying at. So we get down there. I told Saito, I said, Saito, I'll go down. Don't worry about it. Because he was wrestling Mad Dog Vashon earlier that evening. And Mad Dog hit him in the knee with a chair and fucked his knee all up. Sure. So, yeah, I, I told him, no, I'll, I'll go down. So I walked down there. And uh, so anyway, this kid comes up, throws it. I said, what'd you throw the rock through the window for? Yeah, fuck those assholes. They fired me last week. I said, so, oh, okay. And so he was pissed off at uh, McDonald's for firing him. And so that the kid that was at the drive-up window, he said, aren't you Ken Patera? I said, yeah. He said, oh, I watch wrestling all the time. And... Uh, I said, sorry about that uh, window deal. Well, you should have thrown the rock. I said, I didn't throw the rock. I said, whoever you fired uh, a week ago or whatever, he's the one that threw the rock. Well, no, I saw you throw the rock. I said, you didn't see shit because I didn't throw the rock. (laughs) And so anyway, I, I, I never got accused of throwing the rock through the window. That was proven to be someone else. But in the meantime, uh, I, I, so I, I left because they, they wouldn't serve me. I said, well, what are all those hamburgers uh, for? They had two trays piled with big or not, uh, double cheeseburgers. Well, that's for a TV commercial that we're shooting. I said, oh, that's what the cameras are for. Yeah. And I said, well, what are all those other people doing in there? Those are employees. Because they had the doors locked. I couldn't get in. Yeah. So anyway, they were shooting a TV commercial for their double quarter pounders. I guess they were having a sale on them or something. Anyway, uh, I said, I'll give you 20 bucks for four of them. And, uh, because back then, uh, double quarter pounders were, what, buck and a half? Yeah. So I said, here's 20 bucks, keep the chain, just give me four. No, I can't give them to you. I said, fuck. I said, is there any other restaurants around here? No. Because we were in Waukesha, it was a small town at the time, just, just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I walked back up to the Holiday Inn. Of course, that their restaurant closed like eight o'clock, so there was no food. And you know we've been drinking. Uh, so anyway, I tell Saido, I, I I told him what had happened down at McDonald's. Next thing I know, somebody's banging on our door. You know, it's about quarter to one, twelve thirty, quarter to one, whatever. And uh, I was on the telephone talking to my wife. and t- um, So Saito uh, answers the door. And I hear boom, 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 boom. You know, I, what the fuck's going on out there? So I get up and go out. The door had closed behind Saito. He's standing out in the hallway in his underwear talking to two police officers. So I open the door and I said, what's going on? And so there's this uh, young girl, she was a cop, looked like olive oil, you know, Popeye's girlfriend. Certainly. Yeah, she was like 5'10", 5'11", weighed about 120 pounds, skinny as a stick. So she says, well, Mr. Patera, we have a report that you were down at McDonald's earlier and you threw a rock through a window. I said, oh, hold, hold on, hold on. I said, I was at McDonald's trying to get a couple of hamburgers for Saito and I. I didn't throw the rock. And so she said, well, that's what they told us. Well, they told you wrong. So anyway, I had a witness that I didn't know that came forward later on and uh, saw the whole thing outside. 
Yeah, that was too late. So anyway, the cops uh, uh, go to uh, May Saido. Saido was standing in front of me. And uh, so he ducks, and that little bitch sprayed all that uh, uh, mace in my eyes. And I couldn't see shit. I just got furious. So I grabbed the can out of her hand, and she hit me. And I said, fuck this. And so her partner, uh, John, John Dillinger, I'll never forget his name, just because John Dillinger was a famous criminal back yeah. in the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. That was his name. I, yeah, I swear to God. So anyway, uh, I turned, uh, he, he went to interfere. So I said, just stand back. In the time, meantime, so she jumped on my back and tried to claw my eyes. And I said, fucking bitch. So I, I knocked her off with my elbow. And she fell off me, hit her head on the wall. And I guess it knocked her out. That's what she says it did. Anyway, two seconds later, there's 16 cops oh. in that hallway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they had state cops, city cops, uh, county sheriffs. There's 16 of them all together. And uh, that's what they told us later. You beat up 16 cops, Padera. I said, fuck, I was fighting for my life. They all had their billy clubs out, uh, trying to hit us in the head. And they all denied it because they're not supposed to hit uh, people in the head with their billy, billy clubs. Well, they were whacking us. I mean, I, I had three or four big bruises on my head. And uh, same with Saido. And anyway... It took us about three minutes to stack them all up like kindling would. Jeez. And, uh, yeah, but when the smoke cleared and settled down, I said, hold on, hold on. And fucking John Dillinger was standing there with his fucking 357 or 347 Magnum pointed right at me. I said, hey, 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 put the gun down. I'm, I raised my hand. Put the handcuffs on us. You know, we're going to jail. Take us to jail. And uh, he says, if you take one move, Patera, you know, he knew I was. I'll blow your fucking brains out. I said, settle down. Settle down, officer. And so that we let him put the cuffs on us and take us to jail. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, a fucking mess. So, here's the thing that, you know, makes Vince McMahon a genius back in the day and, and all the things, all the praise that, is, that he gets. You were, you know, you're this Olympic hero to begin with. And you, you come out of prison, but they do these vision nets. And it's funny because it's still on the WWE Network today. You could go watch, and I'm, I'm talking to the fans at home listening here, you could go watch the Ken Patera story. It's incredible, the documentary they did on him, but there's these visionettes where you're coming, you know, you're filming it from the prison cell. Was that really an actual prison cell somewhere? Or, or how did they film that, and, and whose idea was it? Because I thought those were really creative. Yeah, well, that prison cell was in the old city jail in Baltimore. Yeah, because uh, Gene Okerlund, uh, and I had to go to the TV studio and uh, uh, do that interview, you know, that whole documentary we did. We did that at a TV studio down in uh, Baltimore. So uh, the, the city jail had been uh, vacated, uh, you know, a few months prior to that uh, because they, were, they built a new jail, I guess. So they uh, they got permission to use the, the a jail cell down there, and that's how that happened. Uh, yeah, Baltimore. That was 
in Baltimore. Yeah. How legitimate was it? Like, did you get to look at the scripts and and the ideas behind it? Like, do you have any input on it? I had absolutely zero input, and I I read the fucking script, and I'm thinking to myself, fucking Vince must have written this. <laughs> So I asked uh, uh, Jane Okerlund, uh, you know, the uh, yeah. announcer. Yep. I said, Jane, I said, this doesn't, this doesn't sound anything like me. Who wrote this shit, Ben? He says, you got it, brother. Yeah, Ben, ben wrote the whole thing. I said, be nice to that motherfucker would let me know. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he didn't let me know shit. We get down to the fucking jail. Here's the script. I uh, son of a bitch. So I had no input. I, I told Gene. I said I'm not going to do this. I said uh, if, if if he wants me to write, you know, to read something off a script, I I said I want some input. And so I I tell Gene to call them. So Gene calls Ben. They had a payphone there. So he says, uh, God, I think I might have got on the phone. I said, Ben, this is a bunch of bullshit. I said, I'd like to have some input into my own story. He said, well, just, just run with it, and uh, we'll film it. And then uh, when the whole product is done, then uh, if you don't like it, we'll redo it. Well, I told him I didn't like the fucking shit. They, so we didn't, never redid anything. Nope. So I had zero influence into that. And it could have been so much better that Vince, you know, he was on his high horse and he knew everything. And so that's how that came out. Here's what you did do, though. Yeah. And this is iconic. So I thought those were kind of cheesy. And I was like, I wonder how much input he had in this. And that's why I asked you that question because I've wondered for a long time about that. So you finally got your chance to speak, like from you personally, about the new gimmick, the Olympic hero, coming out of prison, the redemption story, all that great stuff. And what I think is one of the coolest segments I've ever seen way back in the day on WWE probably challenger superstars the debate the debate with bobby heenan in the middle of the ring guys fans watching at home you need to go and watch the debate it is hilarious he beats heenan's ass it's hysterical um can you just kind of talk about that night because that was really a big deal yeah well i knew about the debate and uh uh what the hell was the guy running uh uh, WWF Vince brought that uh, Dick Eversol. Right. He was from ABC, I think. No, so he was the NBC guy for Saturday Night Live, which we, he did a lot of oh, partnerships okay. with him, man. Yeah. Yeah, NBC. N- nice guy. And uh, so, I- anyway, uh, he says, Ken, why don't we get together uh, and. Uh, Go over this uh, thing. Vince wants me to write a script for you, and he, I'd like to have your input. I said, "Well, thank God somebody does." <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we went over what we we're going to talk about. Uh, Dick, myself, and Bobby Heenan, and so anyway, we got it worked out. So we go out to the ring. Gene Okerlund was. Uh, uh, um, he ran it, you know, he played, uh, Shane was in the ring with Bobby and I anyway. So anyway, we start the debate and we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, Bobby says, I'm fucking fed up with you, Ken, but there are takes his belt off and starts whipping me with it. Yep. I, I picked him up, turned him around, slammed him in the corner, took the belt away from him, smacked him a few times, put the belt around his neck, pulled him out of the corner, and I threw him. 
and uh, with the belt still around his neck, I gave it a big jerk, and he flopped. He was about five feet off the ground, and uh, he came uh, crashing down on his face. And uh, so, and that was all planned. Bobby didn't get hurt. It looked like I tore his head off. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, but uh, that's how good Bobby was. And uh, so anyway, uh, I'm standing over him all, all pissed off and everything, especially what he said about my children, <laughs> you know, being snuck kids and everything. And all I was good for, uh, instead of pressing weights, was pressing uh, license plates. License plates. plates. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he, he was a vicious little man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought that was classic. Was, oh, it was a classic. That was great. How yeah. hard is it not to crack character, like, and laugh? I mean, you guys aren't actors. You're real people. So how tough is it not to laugh in certain situations like that? When, you know, you know what the guy is saying. He, he's saying it just to bust your ass. Yeah, well, we were in Winnipeg once, and I was, I think I was wrestling Hulk Hogan. And Heenan jumped in the ring two or three times, you know, and Hulk kept trying to get him, but he couldn't get him. And then Bobby said something. I, I tell you, both Hulk and I were laughing so fucking hard. <laughs> I pissed myself. <laughs> I literally pissed myself. Uh, peas running down my fucking uh, inside of my thigh, uh, all the way down to my wrestling boot. I couldn't help it. I couldn't hold it. Yeah. And so finally I jumped out of the ring because I, I didn't want the people to see me peeing myself. But anyway, it was hard not to notice. <laughs> so, so I got a, a few and, more and questions. Hulk, oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, then the Hulk started laughing. So I jumped out of the ring because I didn't want both of us in there laughing. Yeah. Anyway, but I jumped out of the ring. I told Kane and I said, you son of a bitch. I said, <laughs> I, you got me laughing so hard, I pissed myself. And uh, so anyway, yeah. You know, a couple years... Well, not really even a couple of years, but pretty early into your return back into the WWF and and you're trying this new gimmick out and everything. The one big thing they did for you was, and I was there. I was there as a, I was a little boy. I was young. But you guys came to Richfield, Ohio, which, again, for the fans, oh, yeah. it's about 20. No, it's more than that. Actually, it's about 45 minutes. It's a hike from Cleveland, but it's, it's known as Cleveland. But in Richfield, Ohio... The first ever Survivor Series. You were in the main event. You were on the same team as Hulk Hogan, Bam Bam Bigelow. I want to. I I don't know. Maybe Hillbilly Jim. I can't remember. And then like Paul Orndorff. Right. So against Andre the Giant, it was big. What was yeah, it like? Superstar Billy. Oh yeah, Superstar yeah. Billy Graham. Yeah, he got hurt. So yeah, he... so Morocco. I think Don Morocco stepped in for him. That's what it was. Yeah. So, right. but with that being said, though, that's a pretty big spotlight, and really your your biggest push since the return. How did that feel? Well, you know, that was the night uh, I gave my notice to Vince, and uh, I was I had the flu so bad, and I was sharing a room with uh, with uh, Jimmy Brunzel. And uh, I told Vince that I had the flu and I was sick. And he didn't believe me. Well, Jimmy Brunzel was standing right there. And he said he's been sick all all last night and all day, Vince. And he's telling you the truth. So I'm thinking to myself, that motherfucker doesn't believe that I had the flu. Fuck him. But anyway, uh, uh, SummerSlam was after that, wasn't it? Yeah, so I'm going to walk you through the series of events. So that was Survivor Series in Richfield. A few months later, because I, I got a pretty good question here. I actually got a couple questions here about this. WrestleMania, um, it was the first WrestleMania and the only WrestleMania I believe you were ever on in Atlantic City, Trump Plaza, 
the first one they did at WrestleMania 4, you were in a battle royal to start the night. At the end of that battle royal, the winner was Bad News Brown. Do you feel that they should have put you over in that situation, or why do you think they went with Bad News Brown over you for the for the big finish to start the night with the battle royal? Well, I I was already uh, I'd given my notice. I was leaving. Okay. Yeah, I I I had had it up to my eyebrows with all of this bullshit, and uh, I was just uh, I was ready to go. And I, I had been, I think I gave him my notice like six or seven months prior to that. You sure did. I said, Ben, yeah, I said, Ben, you want me to put over Bad News Brown, Big Boss Man, King Kong Brody, or King Kong Bundy? Uh, King Kong Brody and I were good friends. Uh, I helped bring him in the business down in Texas back in, oh, God. What year was that? Seventy five, I think. Do you think he would have been one of but the anyway, all time greats if he didn't get murdered? If he didn't get murdered? Oh yeah, yeah. He was kind of like me. Yeah, he he didn't work any particular uh, territory because he was working in Japan like twenty twenty five weeks a year. So when he come back over here, he he was freelancing all the time. <laughs> And that's what I was doing. I, I wrestled uh, uh, in, uh, when I was in the WWF in 1980. I beat Pat Patterson for the Inter- Intercontinental Championship. And then the next week, I beat uh, one of the Von Erich kids for uh, the Missouri State title. The Missouri State Championship, which was held... Uh, run out of Keel Auditorium in St. Louis at the time was a big deal. That was almost like the uh, NWA championship bill. Okay. And I yeah, I, I, I beat him and then uh, I beat somebody else later on. I dropped the belt to Dick the Bruiser and then I, I won it again. I can't remember who in the hell I beat. But anyway... Uh, so I was the only buddy. I was the only one in wrestling history to hold the Intercontinental Belt and the uh, Missouri State Championship Belt at the same time. I want. And that's because. I, go ahead. Oh no, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I just I wanted to go ahead because we have two more questions left here to to wrap up the interview. Um, and wanted to thank you again for being on the show. I know the fans will absolutely love when they hear this. Um, two questions to go though. And this one, I want to stay at that WrestleMania one more time. So that same WrestleMania, WrestleMania four, as you said, you were starting to wind down your time in the WWF that night, they made a big switch instead of having Hulk Hogan win the tournament to get his belt back. They went with Randy Savage. So just a couple questions here about Randy Savage. Why do you feel like Vince McMahon felt it was time to let somebody else carry the world title for a year? And at the same time, what was he like with Miss Elizabeth? Was it, Were you guys allowed to talk to her? Because there were so many crazy stories about Miss Elizabeth being locked in a locker room all day and only being, you know, only allowed to come out to, to walk to the ring back and forth with Randy. Is any of that true? It's all true. Wow. R- Randy was very possessive. And goddamn, his brother, uh, Lanny, mm-hmm. Lanny Popo, he passed away. Uh, recently, uh, but he he could tell you more than me uh, since he since they were brothers. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, he was very overly possessive of Miss Elizabeth. She was really a sweet girl. You know, she liked to do her cocaine and smoke her marijuana. And uh, uh, but anyway, you know, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole with that but yeah she just uh, she was kind of a, a very fragile person because of Randy and uh, she was smart she was a smart girl and uh, it was uh, she she didn't have any say so in anything Randy ran the roof he did 
he would talk for her. He would, uh, everything about Miss Elizabeth that had to go through Randy first. And uh, it was just, it was a sad story. I, I, I didn't realize that he was so possessive. But whenever you see that, see that, you know, uh, a guy totally dominate a woman like that. It's just, uh, it's an insecurity of, about the guy, not the woman. And, uh, yeah, it was all true. All those stories uh, about uh, Randy dominating uh, Miss Elizabeth, it's all true. Was she yeah. beautiful? Yeah, she was a pretty girl. Yeah, she was very pretty. You know, because, I mean, at a uh, home, stunning watching her on TV. I never met her in person, but just from, you know, at home watching her, she never came across as being slutty or any kind of, like, sleazy looking. She oh. was, like, she was classy, beautiful. Yeah, she was a classy, beautiful girl. She re- she really was. She, she was, uh, she wouldn't even know how to act sleazy. Yeah, she was, uh. She had her shit together, Do you th- and she would just, uh, yeah, she would just uh, uh, freeze when Randy, if she was trying to talk to somebody that Randy put in, yeah, she would just freeze up. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pathetic, yeah. Do you think, um, or, you know, just the, the second part of that question, though, why do you think he, Vince McMahon, thought, hey, for a year we're going to go with uh, Macho Man on top instead of Hogan? Yeah, I, I don't even remember that. Okay. Tell you the truth, but, but I have an idea. Uh, Hulk probably got uh, involved with uh, some other stuff that was going to keep him away. Uh, from, no holds uh, barred the movie. I, yeah, movies and uh, uh, some commercial stuff and uh, you know personal appearances that Vince wanted him to do, and uh, so that I, I if that actually happened, that that that's why. But uh, you know, Randy was a good choice. You know, I was gone by then, wasn't I? No, you were still around, and I mean you. So you um. You know, the first question I asked about the Richfield Coliseum, just to give you a, a time frame. So Survivor Series was November of 87, and your last match was all the way almost a year later. It was at um, near SummerSlam when you lost to Bad News Brown at Madison Square Garden, and that was the first ever yeah. SummerSlam. So, you know, if you had put in your notice in Richfield in November, you still stuck around another seven or eight months, which is, you know, pretty admirable. To finish that out, the, you know, I have one silly question for you here. You know, all the questions have been pretty serious, but, you know, this is kind of what they call like a guilty pleasure, you know, stupid fan question. So sure. at that same WrestleMania, you're again, you're at that WrestleMania at Trump Plaza. I just have to know, you know, there were three people there. There was obviously Don, uh, Donald Trump, but also Bob Uecker as the ring announcer and Vanna White as whatever the hell she was. I don't even know, but she was there. So you had Bob Uecker, Vanna White, and Donald Trump. Did you get to meet any of the three of yeah. them and socialize with any of them, or do they keep them separate from everybody else? I met them all. What were they like? I, I, I was at, yeah, I was at a banquet the night before with Vanna White and uh, Bob Uecker, and uh, I had a few drinks with Bob. And Vanna, uh, she didn't have any makeup on, and she had, uh, you know, just a, a regular dress. Her calves were so skinny uh, <laughs> that they weren't even as big as my wrist. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and she had a horrible complexion. She had pock marks. Wow. She must have had acne so bad when she was a kid. Uh, but yeah, but she was nice. You know, she was a nice girl. Uh, Bob Uecker was—he uh, was a funny son of a bitch. He—he he was as funny as well. He wasn't as funny as Bobby Heenan, but he was a close second. <laughs> and and uh, Donald Trump, I—I I talked to him for about two minutes backstage, 
uh, before the Battle Royal. And he come in with his entourage. He must have had six or eight people. Uh, you know, four, I, yeah, I think it was four on each side walking through. Uh, we were all uh, uh, backstage. Uh, that was our locker room. They they didn't have any locker rooms for us, so we all all uh, dressed back uh, on the backstage behind the curtain. And uh, yeah, Donald Trump came. So nice guy, real nice guy. And uh, Vince introduced us, and uh, uh, Trump said, yeah, I, I know you, you're the strong guy. You're the uh, Olympian guy, right, the weightlifter? I said, yeah. And so we sat there and talked. I don't know what we talked about, but we, it was about two or three minutes, and then he moved on, you know, met, met some of the other guys, and then he went, went out, you know. Uh, uh, about an hour before the show, I guess. And so, yeah, yeah, Donald Trump, uh, he's a good guy. I like him. Who is stronger, you or the Ultimate Warrior? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a fucking insult. You know, they may, <laughs> I, I've never seen a bigger deal about a guy like that that had... Next, you know, very limited ability. I just, and people still love him to this day, even though he's passed on and everything. I just never caught on to, you know, they had a guy like you, a legitimate strongman, you know, competed for our country, and then they had a guy like that who they pushed to the moon. Boy, they made him millions. I, I never made millions. Uh, well, the reason for that, Vince loved bodybuilders. And the, 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 you know, and he had uh, all these guys all drugged up on steroids and everything. I, I never took steroids when I wrestled, and uh, uh, I did some bodybuilding back in the early '80s, and you know, trimmed down to about 260, got pretty buff. But uh, he loved guys that uh, were all pumped up on uh, steroids. And uh, Jim Helwig, mm-hmm. uh, that's the ultimate warrior. That's his real name. But I, I met him before he even got, I met him when he was going to chiropractic school. Uh, 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 he was going to become a chiropractor uh, when I was wrestling down for Georgia Championship Wrestling down in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And he was a nice guy. I, I said, well, what, what do you want to do? He came in there with Bill Kazmaier. He came in this gym, Coffee's gym. And, and John Coffee was a good friend of mine that owned the gym. And anyway, uh, uh, Coffee introduced us. And I said, yeah, yeah, big, big guy. I said, uh, what are you going to do uh, uh, when you're done with chiropractic uh, school? He said, well, I'm going to become a chiropractor. And uh, I said, well, John said that uh, you were interested in becoming a pro wrestler. Yeah, well, I was thinking about it, but I don't think so. I said, yeah, but with your size and the way you look, I said you might be able to make, uh, make some money at it. I said, you ought to give it some thought. And Next thing I know, he's a dingo warrior in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I knew him, oh, God, way before he got to the WWF. That's yeah. fascinating to me. I never knew that. That's a new story. So my, my last question for you, and uh, we thank you for taking the time today because it's been a pretty long interview, so thank you. The final question for you today is do you do you ever expect to hear from the the WWF that you'll be going into their Hall of Fame? I don't think so. Is that something yeah, why, you would accept? Why would, he, why would he put me in forty years after uh, when he should have put me in twenty years ago? You know, uh, but. 
But he's somewhat of a fucking asshole. He he knows what how I feel about him. And uh, the the Hall of Fame is is a figment of uh, Vince McMahon's imagination. You don't go in the Hall of Fame unless Vince you in the Hall of Fame. I says, well, and people ask me about that. I said, well, I'm in the St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame, which is probably uh, has more notoriety to it than Vince's WWF Hall of Fame. I'm in the Weightlifting Hall of Fame. Uh, I was inducted into the Weightlifting Hall of Fame uh, uh, within a month after uh, the Olympic Games in 72. I said, I'm in my high school Hall of Fame. And I, I, there's a couple other Hall of Fames I'm in. So not being in the WWF Hall of Fame isn't a big deal. And there's a lot of guys that turned it down. I can't think of any of them right now, but I, I, I remember talking to Bruno Sammartino. I said, you ever going to go into Vince's Hall of Fame room? I used to talk to him a couple times a year. He says, fuck that asshole. I'll never go in the Hall of Fame. So next thing I know, Bruno's, what, 15 years later, whatever it was, uh, 20 years, whatever. And uh, here's Bruno. He's doing the color commentary for Vince, and he's in Vince's Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And so one time I was talking to Bruno. I was saying I was talking to him down in Charlotte, North Carolina, at a convention down there. <laughs> and uh, I said, Bruno, how much did you charge Vince to put you in the Hall of Fame? I said, he usually pays uh, everybody that goes in and gives them 5000 Dollars. He's well. I should tell you this, but uh, five hundred thousand. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and he didn't pay him five hundred thousand up front. He gave him. Uh, he paid him for the color commentary on TV that Bruno did, and he gave him fifty thousand a year for ten years. That, that's what Bruno told me. Now, I don't know uh, what else, you know, but that's how it all went down. Tremendous interview today with uh, legend Ken Matera. Ken, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, and have a great day. It was a pleasure, my friend. Say to all my friends out there that I have a book coming out. Are we still on? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Plug the book. Go right ahead. Okay. Weight of the World, Ken Patera story. And uh, it's 465 pages. You can order it on uh, walkingonhotwaffles.com. W-O-H-W. Walking on Hot waffles.com and I think it's around twenty four ninety five. it's worth 50 actually it's worth ninety nine ninety five. tell you the truth uh, I gotta uh, pump myself up here there you go it's a great read starts right from my childhood all the way uh, to summer slam and uh it's, it's a good read. Talks about my Olympic stuff, uh, some about my high school years, my uh, college uh, years at Brigham Young. And uh, it, it's a good read. I think uh, people will enjoy it. Well, we thank you very much for doing that as well. So we're going to check that book out uh, when it comes out, and I'm sure it's going to be an amazing read as well. And uh, when it does, though, I'll have you back on and we'll talk about the book. It comes out on W-O-H-W on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. Two more days to go. That's Saturday. Huh? That's in two days. 
Yeah, a couple days. Yeah. It'll be out. And, uh, for everybody that enjoyed this uh, interview, uh, I think uh, it's going to be a multiple website. Uh, but uh, uh, Rick Flair uh, did the intro for me, and he's going to have it on his podcast. Uh, for those uh, that watch uh, Animal up in uh, Toronto, uh, Canada, he's going to have it on his website and uh, there are four or five other websites. And uh, I hope everybody uh, buys it so I can retire. <laughs> Remember, I'm almost, I'm almost 80 years old. Now, and remember, I was a professional wrestler when none of us made any big money. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I'm doing fine. I just built a big house uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, I get lost in this place sometimes. There you go. But anyway, yeah. Okay. Well, thank Thanks you again. again. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. That was Ken Patera, former, well, never a former, always a legend. And we want to thank him for his time. You've been listening to the Wrestling with Legends podcast. Vince McKee, have a good night.